Welcome to Watchtower History. George Fisher, co-author of The Finnish Mystery, has a story that is reminiscent of Ray Franz, who was disfellowshipped from the governing body. Due to recently uncovered documentation and correspondence, we are revisiting our previous discussion on the man who dared disfellowship Rutherford. Remastered and revisited. Jeff and I are here today. We're going to talk and have a discussion on a little known fact amongst many Jehovah's Witnesses that Joseph Rutherford was actually brought up for disfellowshipping charges. Say what? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, that is true. And it actually even made it in the early Awake magazine or slash Golden Age, as we'll get into as we elaborate on our discussion. The man who dared to fellowship Judge Rutherford. George Fisher was one of the editors of the Watchtower magazine. There's a few photographs of him. There's not very many known, but he was one of those that with Rutherford and Woodworth uh, went to prison for things that were said in the Finnish mystery, things that they had done. So at one time they were friends and they were close. They were writing together. They went to prison together. And then as things evolved after the death of Russell, he accused him of some things that we'll discuss as we further go along. You get a little personal flair of what he was like. It says he played the very large organ of 70 pipes. That's cool. Yeah, you know. He's like little... an Igor in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An absorbingly interesting discourse by Brother Fisher now followed. All who have heard Brother Fisher address the friends are acquainted with his terse sentences and didactic style. As usual, he had the audience closely follow his talk, pricking up their ears at his abrupt questions and answering them more or less in unison and accuracy. That's from the Enterprise. Cool. The authors of the hymn, What a Triumph of His Grace. It's C.J. Woodworth and George Fisher. The two authors of The Finished Mystery. Ah, oh, that's an interesting piece. <laughs> yeah. Definitely cool. Fisher wrote the music and Woodworth the words. Now, that, that's something people watching this might be interested in. How many of the earlier songs did the Bible students write themselves? Because some are, are, are typical um, that were already out there by other authors, like glory, glory, hallelujah. Right, and um, they would just change the words. And yeah. how, how many uh, songs did the international Bible students write for themselves? Do you know that? I know that Rutherford was really against hymn singing. And so the, the hymn books got smaller and smaller. And then after Rutherford died, then they started getting larger and larger. And they were all original songs at that point. But the Bible students of Russell's period or the early Rutherford period, they would take and either write original songs or they would take hymns that everyone would know and they would, or songs, and they would write their own words to it. One of the examples I was going to bring up is the German national anthem. Uh, the Bible students used the melody from that and, and wrote their own words to it. So that became very, very poignant when you got to the time of the Holocaust. And we'll have a future discussion on that and why that hymn is important. But again, another discussion for another time. The Finnish Mystery was a controversial book uh, amongst the Bible students of the period. There are many who didn't accept it. This people's paper was a Australian splinter group. This one is the old corn gems. This was the Standfast movement. They loved the seventh volume, but they thought it was the very, very end. So we'll do a discussion on them in the future. Uh, there was also PSL Johnson's paper. And he wrote several things against the book as well. And then you had the Pastoral Bible Institute, the Herald of Christ's Kingdom. Now they pretty much remain neutral on a lot of these subjects. Whenever there was a controversy or something, they just stayed out of it. Even if they were mentioned in the controversy by Johnson or, or the Watchtower, they just kept silent. So you'll, if you look at the Johnson's magazine and the Watchtower and the golden ages of the 1920s, you can actually see them going back and forth 
-hmm. and in one of our future discussions coming up, uh, that becomes very, very important in regards to the sheep and the goats doctrine. And there, looking back at history, he was a bold, brash man who wasn't afraid to step on anybody's toes. Right. Well, no, he didn't take into consideration the editorial <laughs> committee. He just wrote what he wanted to write, and they, for whatever reason, just, okay, and did it. Yeah, and, and as we'll see in, in the future discussion that we're going to have, a lot of Rutherford's interpretations are in reaction to some of the other splinter groups and their interpretations. And so they are trying to one-up each other. There's stories I heard about the Finnish mystery where the day it was released, people were reading out of the book because they were so fascinated by, oh, you know, a new book. And they're reading it and you start hearing chuckles. And one of the, I heard a story about one of the people that was there said, hey, what are you, what's so funny? And the person said, when you get to page such and such, then come to me and talk about it. When, and when she got to that page, she started laughing too. It was the one about, you know, if you measure from this point where the Finnish mystery is written in Scranton, Pennsylvania, all the way up to Bethel, it's exactly 1,600 furlongs, as long as you went the route and took the Hoboken Ferry. So that proved that it was foreknown by God, that that would be a judgment message against Christendom, right? This is a political cartoon about the seventh volume that was put in the Enterprise. They were doing a lot of political cartoons at the time. Some of them are actually pretty interesting drawings, uh, scriptural themes. The path of the just is just as the shining light that shines more and more into the perfect day. Uh, notice here that it says, Fisher said that one passage in the book, conscription will meet with opposition, was not written by him, but had been edited into the copy after he turned it in. This is from the United States against Rutherford trial. This so is the Fisher was called as a witness. Right, because of the revelation part of the Finnish mystery that Woodworth wrote. And so it says, Mr. Fisher never said anything about correcting the proof. No, he did not. There was no edits done to this book. And any edits that were done were done very quickly, and the authors were not asked about it. That would be like me taking what you write and... And editing it without editing telling it me. Without telling yeah. me. Wow. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the November 20th, 1917 Enterprise. It says he used his chart of Ezekiel's temple. The chart was literally bigger than a barn door. He loved talking about Ezekiel's temple. That was his thing. One of Fisher's favorite subjects was the subject of love. And it's very interesting how one noted for love in, in, in their religion was ultimately ostracized. And a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses today, you hear them over the years talk about they're more concerned with how many hours you put in, how many books you, you, you place to people, how many hours of this, and not a focus on love. Yet the very essence of the Bible in Christianity is you'll be known by the love. So I find it very, you know, ironic how systematically things follow through once uh, other people got their hands on the legal entity. Well, if, to bring it to today's perspective in our COVID-19 world, I've been attending the Kingdom Hall. and I've never been a Jehovah's Witness, never been baptized a Jehovah's Witness. I've just been dropping in to listen to see what's going on. And they keep talking about their unity and their love for each other and how much more they see love in all these meetings that they're having. But nobody's discussing anything. There's literal utter chaos before the meeting begins, up until everyone's muted. And then when the meeting ends, right at the end of the meeting, when they're unmuted, it's just utter chaos. And there's... 50 people or 100 people all talking on top of each other saying, I love you, this person. I love you, that name. I love you. I love you. Everyone talking to each other. I'm the unknown equation. I've been going for a couple months, and they never mention my name. I'm completely ignored. <laughs> it's unusual. If, if your point is to try and save the public that is attending your meeting, why are you ignoring them? It's very peculiar. It, it's it, again, it's more about attendance showing you were at the meeting. So no one could say you weren't there. 
Uh, so th there's a lot of uh, facets behind th their reasoning why why all this transponds the way it does. Now, one of these articles is about Fisher's talk on love at the 1922 Cedar Point Convention. But in one of the articles from the Golden Age that's coming up, it says that 1922 is when the disagreement started between Fisher and Rutherford. So there, there were problems that started at this convention. And what they were, it's very, very interesting. These are the men who went to prison and Fisher uh, included in that because he wrote the Ezekiel portion of the Finnish mystery. The St. Paul Enterprise, of course, had the stories about their prison experiences, uh, their trial, and their uh, return back to Pittsburgh and then Brooklyn later. And this is to show uh, that they were together still at this time. Right. They were all together, uh, all, all the men. One interesting thing about the Finnish mystery is... How, how many editions did they have total, do you know? Uh, I have seven or eight various editions myself. And I think we should do a discussion on this in the future. But one interesting thing about the Finnish mystery is when they published it, certain pages of the government deemed seditious. Government told them, you are not allowed to distribute this book. And so they said, you want to make a bet? And they thought it was because of those pages. So they actually opened up the book and tore out the pages. So there are some copies of the Finnish mystery out there. And I have one on my shelf where when you flip through the pages, there's a whole section where the pages are torn right out of the book. And it's because of this trial that was going on with the society. When the government told them that they couldn't do that, then they thought, okay, well, we can't publish it as a book. Let's, let's publish it as a magazine edition. Government said, no, no, can't do that either. So they published a couple of chapters in the Overland Monthly. No, said they can't do that either. So they abridged the book. And the government said, you can't distribute that either. After they were released pr from prison, they kept updating and revising the book. So in the 1920s, they were publishing the book with the subtitle, The Way to Life and Happiness. Notice the size difference between those two Finnish mysteries. This edition was published without that Ezekiel portion, and there's one chapter that was changed, chapter 12 of Revelation. Now, this chapter 12 is based off of an article Rutherford wrote in 1925 called The Birth of the Nation. And this is the start of the replacement theology. Rutherford starts applying the prophecies to the Watchtower Society after 1914. This was the article that he published without the editorial board. This is when he started to take control. It was very controversial at the time. And then he, as the editorial board kept fighting against him, he just got rid of them. Here's two photos of the men that went to prison. This is just shortly before they went to prison because this is what was published in the Enterprise and in the Watchtower of the time period. You could see the look of their faces, they know what's coming. You can see concern on now, that. Now, the second one, Van Amberg, is beside Rutherford. Yeah. Now, Rutherford was a big dude. He was a big <laughs> man in yeah. his day. Yeah. I mean, this, this is back when, you know, most people were average height, you know. So Van Amberg was actually a very big man. Yeah. Because was was, Joseph was 6'2". That's what I heard. Yeah. 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 So he looks like he's like six, four pushing six, five. Yeah. Like an Abraham Lincoln of the day. A gigantor is what I would call him. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, your height. I would do. <laughs> I'm, I'm more like the guys on the right hand side of the photo. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the first photo, Fisher, who wrote the Ezekiel portion of the book, is in the back row uh, in the left corner. And McMillan is right in front of him. In the second photo, Fisher is the second one from the right. After they were released from prison, they had a large banquet. And you could see the, the men who had gone to prison were at the very end of the table there. And then at the 1919 convention, you'll see the men that had gone to prison sitting there in the front row together. You'll see Van Amberg there in the front with a white beard next to Rutherford. That'd be George Fisher right behind him. 
Uh, Van they look Amber a lot that. happier in this photo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a little bit. they do. It's like there's, woof. <laughs> there's smiles there. You can see you the know. difference between this photo and the last one. Well, in their defense, right or wrong, however it transponded, I, I mean, they were going to do some serious prison time, and this was back in a day when they weren't playing. You know, it's not a lawyer getting, yeah, you know, here it is. Uh, so they had some serious weight on their minds. George Fisher was one of the editors of the Watchtower magazine. And in April 1924, he writes a letter and says, hey, I'm going to temporarily withdraw. The claim is that it was a health issue. The correspondence we see afterwards indicates that this wasn't the case. He did have health issues, of course, and that's what ultimately killed him shortly after this. But yeah, so he wasn't it, making it was that up because he died, did die shortly after that. So he and, and it was stressing him out. It, it was a stressful situation. He died of a heart attack reading out of the Book of Hebrews. But there was also some disagreements between him and others at the society, and so he was just stepping out of the situation. And what was that stressful situation? Says, well done to 